Stayallday.com. Now tuned into the show where you learn the discipline to show up day after day to do the work, the confidence to put yourself out there boldly and offensively, and the mental toughness to continue showing up, doing the work, putting yourself out there, even when the success you've expected to achieve has yet to be achieved. And on top of all this, you get a huge dose of personal initiative, which is the go-getter energy that moves any one of us, including yourself, to go and make things happen instead of waiting for things to happen. And then we put all this together into a series of frameworks, approaches, insights, strategies, and techniques all underneath the umbrella of one unified philosophy that is called Work On Your Game. My name is Dre Baldwin, also known as Dre All Day, and welcome to the show. And today's topic, we are in part two of a five-part series on the underlying drivers of fear, underlying fear drivers that are controlling people's actions. And as a influencer and persuader individual, specifically those of you who are in marketing and sales, what you need to do about these, because if you do not address them, you ain't going to make any money in business. So before we get into this, let me remind everybody, I send out a text every day, guaranteed to have you focus, sharp, and on point to start your day. I call it the daily motivation. You want to receive this message. I'm not asking you, I'm telling you. So here's all you got to do. Text me at my number, 305-384-6894. Every day when the daily motivation comes out, because you're a member of my text community, you'll be getting it. Secondly, work on your game university. That's where I do all my coaching. That's where I do any coaching. Any coaching I do happens there. Any courses I have are there. Any high level training I offer will be there. Any frameworks that I explain out and show you how to apply to your life and business are there. Only way you can be there is by going to work on your game university.com and it's right there. That link and the number to get my text down below in the description. Let's get into the topic. We are on part two of, again, there's a five part series, the underlying drivers of fear. What are the things that cause fear in people? What are they really thinking about when they're afraid? These are all, and we're going to lay them all out in a five part series. I'm going to tell you what they are, why they are, the logical side, the emotional side, and then what you need to do about it. Point number four, fear of rejection. This is the question that people are asking when their fear of rejection is uh, creeping in on them. What if I put myself or my work out there and nobody wants it? What if I get ridiculed? What if I get attacked? What if people push back against whatever I'm doing or representing? What if I wake up tomorrow and I decide to reject myself and my own ideas? What if I just lose confidence in myself? That's a rejection as well. These are all challenges that people have that stop them from moving forward. And all of these challenges originate and exist within somebody's head. So this is an internal issue. This is not an external one. Okay, so these are internal fears right here. The fear of rejection is not really about what other people would or will do or what other people have done, even though many people will use others. They use you know, them, they, the outside world. They use other people as a proxy for this. They use them as a, as a crutch for the fear of rejection. Fear of rejection is not about what other people have done or what somebody else is going to reject. The fear of rejection is about the boogeymen that we set up in our own heads and then we use these imaginary them, those other people out there, we use those imaginary people as a proxy for our own beliefs about ourselves. That's what the fear of rejection is really about. The fear of rejection is not about what other people are going to say or do or think about you because other people are not saying, doing, or thinking anything about you. Because every human being is much more focused on the person in the mirror than they are focused on you, including yourself. You're much more focused on yourself than you are on anybody else. And you spend a lot more time focused on you and your stuff than you do on anybody else and their stuff. So anytime you think the rejection that you're fearing is because of them, it's not. It's because of you. You're just using them as your crutch. Because to just admit that you're rejecting yourself it feels kind of weird. So most people don't do that. So this is about the boogeyman we set up in our own head. And then again, we use other people as our excuse. So as a salesperson, you must persuade, not, not persuade, assuage, assuage this fear. You have to deal with this fear that people have, even though you logically understand that it's coming from their own heads. But you got to deal with this by showing people that you or some element of your offering will hold their hand along the way so that they do not feel alone and isolated. Because if they feel like they're going to be alone and isolated, they are liable to reject themselves because that's what they've done in the past. That's why the fear of rejection is uh, slowing them down and scaring them off right now because it's happened to them before and they will let it happen again unless an expert, a professional, that would be you, steps in and keeps them from doing this to themselves. So you got to hold their hand along the way so they don't feel this 
uh, isolation and aloneness. Point number five. Today we are on part two or five of the underlying drivers of human fear, what to do about them. Number five is the fear of criticism, fear of being critiqued, and especially publicly. The fear of criticism is one of the six basic fears that Napoleon Hill laid out in Think and Grow Rich almost 100 years ago. And I believe that the fear of criticism, and I talked about this in an episode of the show, that the fear of criticism has risen to the top of the list of basic fears in today's world, supplanting what used to be number one, which when Napoleon Hill uh, wrote his book, was the fear of poverty. And the fear of poverty was number one back then simply because he wrote it during the Great Depression. And I wrote about the six basic fears in episode 1860, not wrote, but spoke about the six basic fears and reorganized them back in episode 1860. And I believe that fear of criticism is the top one now. I said that then, almost uh, two years ago, more than two years ago, because these days, because we are so interconnected and it's so easy for one person to find out about another person, even without knowing anyone who knows them, the six degrees of separation is now down to about two to three degrees of separation for the most part. Most people are afraid of being critiqued because it's so easy to be outed when something happens. Like somebody does something at the, the airport and the video goes viral and you got 50 million people who you will never meet all talking about you and they all know your name, they know where you work, they know what you look like, they know, might know your family, they know where you live, you know, all these things about you and have never met you before. It's much more easy to get the message about anything, positive or negative, out there to the world these days. And that's why I believe the fear of criticism has risen to number one. Whole point is, this fear of criticism is a real thing. And while criticism is simply other people having a, a negative opinion or a negative thought or idea about you, Nothing that physically happens to you if you get criticized. And people just criticize you. They might laugh, they may talk bad, they may be angry at you, but nothing actually happens just because somebody criticizes you. Science says, on the other hand, that there is an emotional pain connected with criticism, depending on the way that we receive it. There's an emotional pain connected to it that sends the same message to the brain when we feel attacked that we would feel if we were physically injured. In other words, the way that you receive Criticism, the kind of criticism that you take to heart, you take it emotionally the same way that you would take a physical pain of like breaking your leg or falling down and scraping your knee. It feels the same when somebody criticizes you when you take the criticism a certain way. Doesn't mean any criticism feels like that. Some people, they can just, criticism doesn't bother them at all, but other people, they take it very personally. So the way to address this fear of criticism is to make sure that your prospects understand that you, as the professional, will help them achieve a specific result. And that result needs to be a result that they want that also alleviates their fear of criticism because they know with that result, then they're not going to be criticized because they achieved the result. And it's usually connected to doing something that their fear of criticism is usually connected to them committing to something, but then it not working. So you want to show them that committing to something is going to work because you're going to help them make sure that it works. So make sure that they know that your thing and you helping them do the thing is actually going to work. And you and they must define what it means to work or work is not. You can't just throw that word out. What does it mean? When I say this is going to work, that means this. That means you're going to get uh, this many people going to come to your event. That means this many people going to sign up for your course. It means this, you're going to make this much money. It means you're going to be able to do this many push-ups. It means you're going to lose this much weight. Whatever that work is, you got to be clear what that is. You should outline that and uh, make sure that you and your offering can actually stand up to that. All right, if you're going to put it out there. You got to make sure you do it and make sure that everyone involved is held accountable to make sure that outcome is achieved. Point number six, we are on part two of five here today. We're talking the drivers of fear, what to do about them, where they come from, what to do about them, especially you as a uh, marketer and salesperson and influencer and a persuasive individual. Number six, the fear of overcommitment, also called overload, or also known as overwhelm. I've talked about overwhelm in episodes of this show. Here's the thing that I told you about overwhelm in episode number 1366. All overwhelm is, is you trying to do too many things at once. Overwhelm is a state of mind. It is not an actual you know, occurrence. There's no occurrence that's overwhelm. Now, you can open up your calendar today and see that you have 57 things that need to be done on the calendar and not feel overwhelmed. You could also open your calendar and see you have five things on the calendar and feel completely 
overwhelmed. What's the difference? The difference is how you decide to look at the circumstance determines whether you're overwhelmed or not. Overwhelm, again, is not something that happens to you. Overwhelm is similar to embarrassment, is that it's a frame of mind. It is not something that actually occurs. So you can get uh, what's something that could happen. You can be playing basketball and you can shoot an air ball on a wide open three pointer and you can laugh it off and not bother you at all. But you could also be so embarrassed that you're scared to shoot the ball for the rest of the game and you're a shell of yourself and you do nothing for the remainder of the game because you're embarrassed about that air ball. It's the way that you decide to look at the situation that determines how you feel. Overwhelm and embarrassment are thoughts. They are ways of thinking. Again, they are feelings. They are emotions. They are not, uh, again, actual outcomes. Okay. So shooting an air ball is an actual thing that happens. That's an activity. But the embarrassment is a thought. Overwhelm, same thing. Overcommitment, overload. These are all ways of thinking. So I could have 57 things on my list that I need to get done within the next 24 hours, and I don't feel overwhelmed. I don't feel like I'm overloaded. I don't feel I'm overcommitted. I don't feel there's too much. Somebody else can have five things on their list and feel like it's too much. Just different ways of thinking. So this is a mindset. That's why mindset's the foundation of everything we do here at Work On Your Game. Person who feels overwhelmed, however, they do really feel it. All right, so um, you should not give them a lecture that I just gave you. You just need to understand it. All right, these are things you need to keep in your head, and then you need to deal with them as they are. You got to meet people where they're at. You want to influence them. So the overwhelmed person is the person who says or feels they have too much going on in order to do anything new or different or additional from what they're already doing. Even when doing something new or different or additional is exactly what the doctor ordered because their current process ain't working. All right, this is, again, this is why many of these fears will seem completely illogical and irrational from the outside looking in, but it's completely real to the person that you're talking to. And if you want to persuade somebody, again, what I just said, you got to meet them where they are. Even if you think where they are is irrational world. You got to meet them over in the irrational world if you want to move them to action. So person who doesn't want to do anything different, even though if they keep doing the same stuff, they're going to be uh, in trouble because ain't nothing changing. So interesting thing about this fear is that it's often stated by people who are doing a set of things that is not producing their desired result, which means they know they need to change. They know that what they're doing, the current uh, operating mode that they're in, the set of things that they're currently doing is not working. They know it's not working. It's clear that it's not working. They know they need to do something different. That's how they got into the conversation with you in the first place. We've been talking about what you're talking about. However, they have reasons slash excuses for why they are not wanting to do anything different. And their reason is they're overwhelmed. I got too much going on already. Well, you're too much is exactly why we're here. All right, that's why you have you have too much going on because all the stuff you're doing doesn't work. So how about we get rid of it? So now you are not doing too much. Again, that's a logical argument. Might work with a few people. I would say maybe less than 10%. The rest of them, you got to approach it a little bit differently. So these people are arguing that they don't have the resources, time, attention, focus to do anything different. This, again, a circular reasoning argument that leads a lot of people into and keeps them in mediocrity. It's a circular reason. Well, I'm doing, they're doing a whole bunch of stuff that doesn't work. So they know they need to do something different. You show them what else they got to do. They say, well, I can't do it because I got too much going on. Well, if you keep having that too much going on, you're going to keep being in the same spot of mediocrity. And they get it and they say they understand it, but, and then they go right back to saying why they can't do it. And again, it just goes in a circle. It's like a, a gerbil running around, the, running around a little aquarium. All right, this is how people think sometimes. And again, you got to meet them where they are, even though you think this makes no sense. So if you're reading between the lines, I just read between the lines for you, and you think some of these don't really make sense for anybody to say these things, but at the same time, you know that people do say these things, and some of you who are listening, have said these things. They don't make logical sense, but that doesn't mean that people don't believe them. See, just because something doesn't make sense doesn't mean people don't believe it. How many times have you come across somebody who believes something that you knew didn't make sense? Of course, many times, right? So we all come across people who believe things that don't make sense. And all of us believe things that other people out there think we're crazy because we believe them. They think it doesn't make sense. Beauty of, this is the beauty of humanity is that we all can believe whatever we want. So even though you may think that this doesn't make sense, what these people believe doesn't mean that they don't believe it. And it also, especially most importantly, doesn't mean you should ignore it. All right? And you better not ignore it if your goal is to influence or persuade another person. You cannot ignore their beliefs, even if their beliefs are ridiculous. If you want to influence or persuade a person, you must address 
their fears, no matter how illogical they are. So if you want to address the overcommitment and overload fear, you got to show people how doing your thing will be relatively easy, relatively easy, not require too much of their resources, also relative, and how it can fit into what they are already doing, given that it is actually true, All right, given that your thing can actually do those things. Again, do not tell someone that you can, your thing will help them do something that it can't actually do. So if it can do it, then you have to show that and you have to position it in such a way that they can understand it and that it actually delivers on its promise. This is in the marketing world. This is literally called positioning. The way that you position a product plays a big role in how it's sold, who it's sold to, how much you can sell it for and whether or not it sells, period. It's called positioning, how you talk about things. You could take the exact same product, position it in completely different ways, to get a completely different outcome. George Foreman Grill, for example, sat on shelves in Targets and Walmarts for years and didn't sell much until they positioned it differently, put it on the home shopping network, put George Foreman's name on it and sold it via those uh, call-ins instead of selling it on a uh, department store shelf. And all of a sudden it was making millions and millions of dollars and nothing changed about the product. All they did was change the positioning of the offering. That's the same thing you need to do with your stuff is position it the right way to the right people with the right offer at the right time, with the right language, the right copy. Copy is just the language that you use to persuade people and things can change. And again, you should not try to figure all this out on your own because you had a right, you got to have a right combination and your trial and error process might take you a long time if you ever even figure it out. So all that said, you got to show them how doing your thing will be relatively easy, not require too much resources and can fit into what they're already doing. If on the other hand, doing your thing will require a certain commitment and maybe it's, you know, that it's going to take maybe a lot. It might take a lot of time. It might take a lot of commitment. It might take a lot of resources. It might take a lot of attention, a lot of focus. If you believe that this is true about your thing, then you could, this is just an option. I'm just putting these out here for you to think about. You could say, look, this is going to take a lot of time commitment. This is going to take a big a chunk of your resources. So if you're not ready to make that kind of commitment, then uh, this is not for you. And that's okay. That works as well. All right. That works as well. Why? Because it's going to push out all the tire kickers and all the people who are looking for a quick, easy solution. And it's only going to draw on the people who understand they got to make a big commitment to make it work. Therefore, you know, you're only talking to qualified prospects. A qualified lead in the marketing world means somebody who knows exactly what is going to be asked of them. And they are serious about actually making that commitment. Doesn't mean it's guaranteed they're going to buy, but you're only talking to people who are serious and qualified to actually buy. And the way that you position your offering determines what kind of leads you attract. OK, so then you're pushing away the people who want to use the overload excuse, because now you're only bringing in people who are ready to be overloaded. They want to do it. So there's a guy uh, whose program actually a guy whose program I'm in uh, right now. And he sent out an email and it said, we're going to build because he was talking about building a sales funnel for people. We're going to build your whole sales funnel. We'll do all your copy. We'll write all your ads. We'll do everything right. Soup to nuts will do everything you need to actually start selling your offer. All you got to do is get on the phone with the prospects and, and sell them and collect the money. That's all you got to do. We're going to do everything else. You don't have to do anything on the internet, no ad campaigns. No, we'll do all of it. All you got to do is get into this. And I'm only taking, he was like, I'm only taking like five people or 12 people or something like that. And at the end of the email, it said, by the way, the investment for this is $50,000. And what's the point of him saying that the investment is $50,000? He's letting everybody know if you ain't ready to put $50,000 on line, don't reply to this email. So guess who are the people who replied to that email? All people who know that they got to pay $50,000 to get in. Guess who, guess, guess how qualified his prospects are that he was talking to when he put that email out. I guarantee the only people he was talking to were people who were serious about paying 50 grand and they knew exactly what they were getting into. Not people who were like, uh, thought it might be $500, thought it might be 250 No, he was only talking to people who understood it's $50,000. So if you ain't got 50 grand, you ain't even responding to the email. That's the way you can qualify your prospects. I'm not saying you had to do it that way, but this is an option. And there are people who do literally sell that way. So I'm just throwing these things out here just so y'all have some, y'all understand the vastness of this marketing game. There's a lot of different ways to play it. All that said, let's recap today's class, which is part two of five. We are talking the drivers of fear for many people. And this is specifically referring to in the marketing and sales world. Number four, the fear of rejection. What if I put my stuff out there and nobody wants it? Your job is to show people that you or some element of your offering will hold their hand along the way so they don't feel alone and isolated. Number five, the fear of criticism, of getting uh, just talked neg negatively about or to by some people out there. Some people experience this as serious emotional pain, depending on how they take it. 
Your job is to alleviate that fear of criticism because you're going to help them achieve a specific result that you know you can actually help them achieve. Don't say you can do it if you can't do it. Number six, fear of overcommitment or overload, also known as overwhelm, which is simply a state of mind. A lot of people use this when they're doing a whole bunch of stuff that doesn't work, but they don't want to give it up because of all of inertia. So your job is to show them how doing your thing will actually be relatively easy, won't take them too much of their resources, and it can fit into what they already have going on. So comparatively, it actually looks simple. And again, don't tell them that it's simple if it ain't simple. If it's not simple, let them know. Hey, if it's not simple, maybe this isn't for you. It's okay to push some people away to make sure you get the right people in. So with all that said, tomorrow we're going to part three of this series. Text me. Let me know the best point you got from today's class. My number is 305-384-6894. I'm getting a daily motivation every day once you text me. And work on your game university. That's where I do all my coaching, all my high-level training, all my courses. Work on your game university.com. Link down below in the description. Work on your game. Dre all day.